Good morning. How's everyone today? Okay, so I'm going to try to project my voice the best I can. I usually do pretty good at it because most of the time I do powwows, so we got a lot of drum music that we have to talk to people <laughs> over, or I have to holler at grandkids over, so one of the two happens. <laughs> Um, so my name is Shawnee Yellowcalf. I am an enrolled member of the Arapaho tribe out of Wind River Reservation. I'm going to try to remind myself to speak slowly. <laughs> um, so a lot of what I do is going to be a mixture of contemporary and traditional art. Um, I'm Métis, I'm Arapaho, but I grew, out here, I grew up out here on the coast. So I am the descendant, great-great-granddaughter of Chief Yellow Calf, who was the last Arapaho chief of, the, or last Arap chief of the Arapaho tribe. This picture here was taken in 1927. Um, pretty proud of the heritage that I come from. Um, I didn't grow up on the Wind River Reservation. I grew up on the Coeur d'Alene Indian Reservation for various reasons. So this whole journey, I've only been, I've been doing art since the 90s. I've pretty much been doing art most of my life. My dad was an artist. But five years ago, I was working in the corporate world. My husband comes home and goes, hey, you're an angry person when you come home. <laughs> you really need to quit your job. And I'm like, why? He goes, because you don't play well with others. <laughs> I'm like, I do play well with others. I just don't play well with the people that I'm working with because I was in an industry or is predominantly men, and I'm a very strong woman. And so there was some head clashing going back and forth. So I said, okay, I'll quit my job. He goes, let's do some art. Do art. Do what you love. Let's see where this goes. So this is my husband on our Harley, because, well, we like to take rides. So in some of my pictures, you'll see I use Harleys in some of my things. We have a very big group on the Key Peninsula that we like to ride with. We do various charity events with them as well. So I have other people in my life that are pretty important to me that support me in my venture in my art. One is my daughter right here. She is <laughs> my only daughter. Um, I have two sons, best friend and assistant. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't know half of what I'm doing sometimes. Uh, <laughs> My, my mother, um, bless her heart, is 80 years old. She's also a huge inspiration with me. Um, the first piece that I did was, you'll, you'll see it here in the slides here in a few, is Pray for Us Mother Earth. Um, and we'll talk about that piece when it comes up. But that's the first piece that I did. Then I did it for her for her birthday. Grandkids. Let me tell you. <laughs> I have 12 of them. Um, the five here... I pretty much have on a regular basis. They are the inspiration behind a lot of what I do. And they are the inspiration currently behind the Frybread Trails book. These are some of the pieces right here that you see currently. The reason behind that is because as I get older, I want to leave them something, something to be proud of, something that they can then tell stories with. Frybread Trails comes from being on the powwow trail and talking to people and discussing Where's fry bread come from? Well, fry bread comes from back in the 1800s. As natives were put on reservations and put in forts, we were given flour, water, salt, and dirty lard. It used to be called dirty lard bread back in the day. And that's what they gave us. They said, here, you can make food out of this, or the rancid beef, or whatever else. But as you go across the country, I've learned after talking to various people and different tribal members, fry bread's made differently based on the region. And it's based like that because on the East Coast, they had access to all the goods that came across into Europe, from Europe. So you've got yeast and milk and all these other things. So their fry bread's different. It's usually a little bit more bigger, fluffier. You get a little further into the plains. They don't have as much. They got flour salt and water and some lard so it's a little flat it's denser i mean it's good but it's like not as good <laughs> go further south into arizona you have navajo fry bread navajo fry bread they pretty much the old school fry bread was cornmeal mushed up really really thin thrown on a rock 
cooked in the sun, scraped up and basically rolled. Kind of like a tortilla, but not really a tortilla. Nowadays they use, um, a lot of them would use bread, bread dough, because they had access to it. So there's this size of your head and fluffy and airy. Now, if you go to Canada, fry bread is called bannock bread. Say that again. Bannock bread? Ban yes. So, and it's made with flour, baking soda, water, and that's it. And, it's, and sometimes milk, and sometimes oil too, which is weird. <laughs> But we're not judgy about our. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we are not in any way, shape, or form. So with fry bread, in in Canada, it becomes really small and really thick. So as I go through and I'm talking to people and I'm learning these stories, I want to take these stories and make sure that my grandchildren know these stories and know the history of some of this stuff so that they can then go out and educate other people because that's where education of our culture comes from is teaching our children to go out and educate everybody else about our stories and how things came to be. So in some of these other pictures you'll also see my granddaughter Savannah here is the ballerina right there that's dancing in the aisle of the grocery store because I like to merge contemporary dance style with traditional style because they both have a very fluid form to them and they're somewhat similar in what they do. Now, as I said earlier, I'm a vendor. That's, that's what I do, that's how I make most of what I do. This is my primary job and we travel. We start traveling, I, well right now I'm at a conference at Muckleshoe, but we go to powwows every weekend. I go from here to Oregon to Montana to Wyoming and she goes with me. And as you can see, <laughs> we make beds and take naps wherever we can, <laughs> like legitimately. And again, when we're on the trail, certain stories will come up or certain experiences will come up, which will influence what I will then go home and do or make, or I'll have a thought in my head and I just have to get it out. So we go back to when I was telling you about my mom. So we talk about Pray for us, Mother Earth, which is this one right here. That's the first one that started this whole thing. The original's hanging in our house right now. It's an 11 by 14 acrylic. So the symbolism on this is the lady there has got her arms outstretched because she's asking the creator for prayers. The blanket she's wearing is the Hudson Bay blanket, similar to the one that my mom and my dad were given the day I was born. Then you have the turtle that's here because we live, on, we live on Mother Earth, who is considered a turtle. My mother is part of a bear clan, so there's a bear in there. My mother is also a devout Catholic, takes her faith very seriously. And so therefore there's a rosary hanging off one hand with an eagle feather. I had to balance that out because even though she's a devout Catholic, I kind of lean a little bit more to the other side of my Native American spirituality. Which sometimes can be a little bit of a conversation with, between her and I. <laughs> Still love her to death. And the second one you see um, is done in a lot of Métis with, some with the plain style dresses. Okay, so we have plain style regalia that we wear. A lot of it has cockle shells on it, ribbons, elk teeth or deer teeth that are hanging off of it, um, vibrant colors because we believe life should have a lot of color. So in the Métis style work, everything is floral, bright, colorful, using a lot of color. This piece in particular was done for the Daffodil Festival two years ago. It was a commission piece for them that they asked for for a silent auction. So I went ahead and did that. So it's called Sisterhood. It is the piece that I created that represents the sisterhood that us women have among ourselves that we create from the time that we start grade school because all of us create some type of sisterhood among ourselves as we go through life. So, my husband always tells me, don't get a big head, Shauna. Don't get a big head, stay humble, stay humble. <laughs> I always try to remind myself, stay humble. But sometimes I have to remind myself, in five years, I've accomplished 
three really big things. The last two years, I've had two pieces each in the Washington State History Museum on exhibit, which was a huge, huge thing for me. I was extremely excited about it. This last year, <laughs> thank you, thank you. This last year, Raven Dancer right there was their PR piece for the whole entire three month event. So now when I take that piece out in public, people are like, oh, I saw that. I saw that in the paper. I saw that on a poster. I'm like, so it kind of brings warm, fuzzy feelings to me. I'm going, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, Raven Dancer, again, I'm mixing ballet with the coastal raven dance that they do, along with the geometrical patterns that we use in Plains culture. Because in Plains culture, everything is geometrical. There's no flowing lines to it. It's all geometrical shapes. The top one, Sacred Circle Gallery, that was my first ever solo gallery show that happened from October through the end of December this last year. I was a little overwhelmed <laughs> with it, to be honest. Um, also very humbled by the experience. A couple times, people came out of the first night crying, and I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> I'm like, why are you crying? Did it bring you sadness? There's a piece, and I didn't bring it with me, I had done specifically for this event, because there are pieces that I like to do to bring conversation to issues that we have in Indian country. And it's called The Fight. And this piece deals with alcoholism and drug use that we are struggling with on the reservations currently right now, and incarceration, of which affects my family right now, and one of my, my relatives. And the piece represents not only the issues of the person who is dealing with the incarceration and the abuse, but also the family members as well. Because we ourselves also feel like we're behind bars or we're trying to deal with our own mental health issues because we have to try to help them deal with their mental health issues or they might not want to deal with their mental health issues. So as people are coming out of the gallery, <clears throat> they're just like, I have somebody in my life who's struggling with this very, very thing. And I sat there and looked at that and said, that's how I feel. Okay, good, then the painting did what it was supposed to do. It made you feel empowered to be able to say, I feel the same way and have a voice, and that's okay. The second one down there, or the third one down there, Redmond Senior Project, building opens May of this year. I have a great big huge mural going up. Those pieces are plexiglass prints of the originals. They are four feet by six feet. They are going to be hanging up on a wall with three cedar paddles that I also carved that will be going in between them. And then I just finished the metal Métis flowers that are six and a half feet long. There's two of them that'll go across the bottom. So it's a 3D tile style stack out mural that will be on the front wall as you walk into the new center. So pretty excited for that one. Huge undertaking, not sure if I'll do it again. <laughs> Haven't quite decided. Again, we go back to dancers, because again, I'm very proud of this young lady right here and all that she has become. <laughs> the first one's called Plains Dancer. Uh, it is basically honoring our Sundance that we have every July for Arapaho culture. July and the Sundance is our New Year's. So if you know anything about Sundance, it's a very sacred time for us. It's a three-day event that happens. Second one, as fancy as our ballet. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, fancy is our ballet, also represents the intricate meaning behind ballet and fancy. Fancy dancing, when you dance, they dance like butterflies, so they're light on their feet, just like a ballerina is. The whole concept of fancy dancing is that the, the person came out of a canoe and has become a butterfly, so they have a shawl and that they dance around and very fluently. The other one is All Nations. That one is representing all the nations that we have at a powwow. That represents all the dancers that we have that come out during grand entry. Now if you notice in the two dancer pictures, we have circles, which one is a moon and one is a sun, and they have these black lines that outstretch around them. In the Métis art world, 
The black lines are basically the spirit that binds us all together. So that's representing everything binds us all together within that. Frybread Trails. I got four minute warning, so. Frybread Trails, so we know that's gonna be a book. Um, it's been fun to do, so I'm gonna go through this real quick. We have Blossom Sasquatch right here, named after my mother-in-law who is from Hawaii. It stands about 4'11", who loves Sasquatches. <laughs> <laughs> We have the three-legged dog sitting up there shining the flashlight because there is a three-legged dog on every reservation. We have MC Raven up there, who Blackbird, who is named after my aunt because MCs at every powwow are very loud and boisterous, as is she. We have the coyote up there smoking his peace pipe. We have the bear driving, who's named after a friend of mine who passed away. His name is Big E. And then we have Bob the otter because, well, otter's Bob. Of course, we have two more. We have the first one that was done, which is the 1930s classic car up there. Um, it's probably one of my favorite ones that I've done. That kind of started the whole process. We have the guys down at the bottom down here that are on the motorcycles. Flash to these. Fry bread, we go back to the fry bread because everybody loves fry bread. That just depicts how much we all grew up knowing fry bread, being aunties, grandmas, moms making it for us. Even dogs love fry bread. <laughs> Resopoly is one of my pieces. I'm very careful with where I place it. Corruption is a big thing in casinos and tribal governments. This represents just that. And I have corruption on my reservation within our tribal government, within our casino. It represents tribal council taking money, giving tribal members Resopoly money. We kind of get the back end and don't get a lot of things that we should because the money's being allocated to things that it shouldn't be allocated to. So I have to be very careful. I still play the political game, unfortunately. Two more pictures. Uh, contemporary totem pole. It's called Elements. We have the bear on the bottom, which represents earth. We have the fish in the middle that represents water. We have the eagle on the top. Of course, it represents air. And again, they're done in three different styles. We have tricksters versus the little people, because I've learned the little people translate into tricksters between Coast Salish, Clinket, all the way to the Plains, North and South Dakota. And then, of course, I've got my Honoring Our Elders piece that was done prior to COVID or during COVID, represents all the people that we lost during COVID. We have the three spirit bears. We have the bear that's beginning, the bear that's in present, and the bear that's currently getting ready to walk on. That's my mom's favorite. MMIW. MMIW is huge. It needs more awareness. We have a lot of missing murdered indigenous women. You'll also find it abbreviated as MMIP as we expand um, as missing murdered indigenous people, because as an indigenous people, we are 10 times more likely to go missing than any other cultural delegation um, with about 100% less uh, of any kind of police involvement, media engagement. Our <coughs> sisters have gone missing, they've been murdered, and we have people that have been missing for 20 years, and the cases go cold. We don't get the same support. So it's huge astronomically. So this piece right here, um, the original was, was created for a lady who asked me to make a skirt. I make textiles. My prints become fabrics. So she asked me to make this into a textile, which I then made into a skirt for her. She's the only person in the world who owns it. That piece was in the Washington State History Museum last year. Or no, the year before last, sorry. Do I have one more minute really quick? Or no, am I good? Okay. Um, octopus really quick, because everybody loves the octopus. We live in the Pacific Northwest, who doesn't? My husband had me do this one um, because he used to night dive in Hawaii for him. He used to tell me stories about it because he's from Hawaii. Uh, the other one right there, the frog is called Together. That's my two-spirited Valentine's Day card. Some frogs in culture are asexual, so they can change their sex depending on population needs. 
so I have some friends who are two-spirited. So I created that as a Valentine's Day card for them. And then this is the last slide. Um, I do all kinds of things. I'm an artist. I try to stay as relevant as I possibly can. I do woodworking because I do carve. Um, I make cribbage boards and I paint them. That's a Métis style fish. Um, I also have started doing 3D printing. So we are now doing my art in 3D printing. Uh, we do lampshades, we do night lights, and we're getting ready to do great big huge 3D wall arts with lights behind it as well. So it's been an interesting venture and I encourage other artists to try to go outside of their normal medium and try new ones because not everybody, you know, my husband says, not everybody wants painting. Someone might want it on something else. So that, I think, is the end of it. <laughs> With a little bit of overage, so. <laughs> you can pass those out. So there's, I guess there's a Q&A portion, but really quick. My granddaughter here, because we said something about making new friends. So we like to make new friends by handing out free things. So we have a gift because it's a Native American cultural thing, is to hand out gifts to everybody. So we like to hand out gifts. So we are going, she's going to hand out gifts to everybody. Thank you. But you're welcome. If you so. have a question, just try Um, so the Métis style comes from the floral. They did a lot of floral beading. So all their beading is done in flowers. So they're known as the, they're more known as the floral tribes. So that's where a lot of that comes from. So my mom is from the Métis Red River Band out of Saskatchewan. So when they came through Saskatchewan, they kind of carried all of that with them into like Minnesota and Wisconsin and that area. So. When the Métis came across into Canada, they became Chippewa in the U.S. because for some reason the U.S. government couldn't pronounce Métis. But they could pronounce Chippewa. So, yes, ma'am. Okay, so she's asking in regards, do I, you know, see if I get this right. You're asking if, if I know what I'm going to paint or if it just kind of forms itself more or less in layman's terms, kind of, my concept. Or like the, the symbolism that gets embedded in the entire composition, right? So like you start with like, I really want to do a piece about X, Y, and Z, and then you kind of okay. So in some pieces, it's some pieces I do, some pieces I'll go, I really want to paint about this, and this is what it's going to be. And it just kind of come, it just kind of emotionally just comes out on the canvas. Other times, I'll just start drawing something, and I'll draw it, and then I'll start painting. I'm like, no, take that out, and let's throw this in. And sometimes it just flows in there. It's like just something just comes through, and it's like the canvas in like my head just say something different and then I look at it and I'm like, okay, well that's interesting. I guess some, that really needed to be said. So it's like I tapped into something else in the back of my head that I haven't tapped into for a while. So I have a new piece. So for instance, I have a new piece that's, I had a meltdown the other day. Don't we all have meltdowns? <laughs> oh my goodness, I had to take a six month old with a cat shoved in my tote to the vet and it's crying and I'm just like, oh, I don't, can't do this. I don't know what to do. They were both crying. <laughs> so, you know, there's symbolism in the new painting that I have going in the fact that grandmothers in our culture take on a lot when it comes to raising our grandchildren because it's kind of what we do. We raise our grandchildren. But at the same aspect, you look at it and it's very cartoonish because it's got me and my hair's all over the place and I got the four-year-old hanging on my leg like this and I got her brother pulling her hair like this and I got my teenager taking a selfie like this, you know, and I got the cat hanging out the tote and the baby's hanging onto a bottle and I just look like a hot mess. So there's symbolism in the fact that grandmothers take on a lot and we work a lot and we have dirty laundry and all these other things we have to do, you know, so 
it, it's just it's hard to say. So I, I hope I answered the question okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. If you could, if, is there something out there that you really want to do that you haven't done yet? Like, do you have some hopes and dreams or some project or an idea? I really want to be. I really want to see, I've had two people so far talk to me about it, but it's not come to volition yet. I really want to see these guys as animation. Yeah. Would that not be cool? Yeah. I had a, I have a, I know, right? So I've had, I have a friend up in um, Toronto and she's a, pro, a video producer and she's like, you need to turn Fry Ride series into an animation. I'm telling you, you've got it right there. And I'm going, I don't even know where to start. I have no clue, but I can hear the voices of them talking in my head. I can hear Blossom the Bigfoot with my mother-in-law's thick Hawaiian accent talking, and it's hilarious every time I hear it. I can hear my aunt in her thick Lakota accent screaming as MC Blackbird, like literally <laughs> screaming, and she laughs every time I tell her it's her. <laughs> you know, I, I can hear their voices, which makes it even more fun to start painting and creating oh, them. <laughs> so yes, hopefully one day I will be able to to get them animated. Because I think that would be a, just a really cool, cool thing. So uh, yes. Out of the new, um, you said you're doing 3D printing and you're doing you know, wood carving. What's what's exciting about some of these like, new, easy to use tools and I think what's exciting about it is the excitement that I see on my customers' faces when they see it. So, Muckle Shoot, for instance, I'm up there, and people are walking by, they're like, is that 3D printed? I'm like, yeah, and they're like, is that your art? And I'm like, yeah, they're like, no way! I'm like, yes way! <laughs> they're like, that's so cool! And I'm like, I know, right? It's awesome! And I'm like, you want to play with it? And they're like, yeah! I do, and so I take the lampshade, I give it to them, and they're looking at it, and you can feel the texture, so people who might be sight impaired or something like that can feel the texture, and they can feel what the actual picture is going to be. So it's not just for seeing, it's for other people who might have other disabilities or being able to. Plus, the nice thing is, is they're non-toxic, you can drop them, they roll. If Fido <laughs> eats it, he's not going to die. That's my big selling point with everybody. <laughs> Like, you have a dog, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, um, but 3D printing, I, I love it. I love seeing my art in a new aspect. Um, but again, I always tell artists, try to stay as relevant as possible in today's world. You, you constantly have to keep moving with technology, because if you don't, you stay stagnant back here. And then you're like, why is my stuff not going anywhere? Well, let me see. It's not going anywhere because you're still stuck back here. You need to get this direction up here because everybody else is looking for everything else, new and exciting. So that's kind of where I get excited about it. Yes, ma'am. Um, so looking at your art and all this symbolism you have and you know, really important for your family and your roots, is there one main message or theme that you would want us to take away from all of the different aspects of your work or is it a general just awareness and appreciation I think every time I talk to somebody when it comes to my art, appreciate the color. My biggest thing is the world needs color. I am big on color because I think everything should be colorful. Everything. Color brings happiness. Color brings smiles. Color brings joy. Color brings love. Color brings all the things that we are missing in today's world with all the negativity that we constantly hear on the radio.